So correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard you like graphs. Yeah. <laughs> well, have I got a graph for you? <laughs> so here's a completely made up graph uh, based off an unscientific survey of two anecdotes. I surveyed myself twice. <laughs> so it's how informed we are versus how much information we have. And obviously, the more information we have, the less informed we are. Because now there's too much noise, not enough signal, too much haystack, not enough needles. We can't know what really matters. Here's another graph. How connected we are versus how much information we have. And again, obviously, the more information we have, the less connected we are. Because now, on the internet and all the media, you can find any information to confirm your own biases and beliefs. More information is making us more polarized. Here's another, another graph. How empowered we are versus, let me just skip to the punchline. The more you learn, the more you realize everything's awful and complex and out of your control, and you can't do anything about it, so that sucks. So, I heard you like graphs, and you know, visualizations and all that. I think we're all here because we want to make things and graphics and interactives that really help people and like give information. We want to make things that help people be more informed, more connected, more empowered, but if just putting more and more information out there accomplishes the complete opposite of all that, then I guess for us media makers and journalists in this new age, the question is not, can our field survive, but does our field deserve to survive? And that is our existential crisis. <laughs> But yeah, seriously, um, it is a big problem, but I, to be fair, DataViz, I think, already solves uh, half of that, because data visualization lets us go from the individual stories to the larger patterns. Uh, but I think now we need to go deeper, because if what's under those stories are patterns, what's under those patterns are systems. Water break one. So the problem is we have too much information and not enough uh, understanding. Uh, patterns can show us how things happen, but not really why things happen. Um, and for that deeper understanding, we need systems. So we kind of know already what data viz looks like. What would system viz look like? Uh, so one tool I think might be useful, and not the only tool, um, is simulation. So here's a prototype, uh, not a prototype, a project I actually launched for once, uh, simulating the world in emoji, winky kissy face. Uh, oh, uh, at the end of this talk, I'll have a link to all my slides and resources and projects, so do, don't worry about all this. Uh, anyway, yes, so with this project, um, the reader could uh, play with simulations made in emoji, uh, and they could uh, mess around with the rules and even create their own simulations. And these simulations were used to explain systems, systems like ecosystems and why forest fires are actually good for the forest, or systems of epidemiology, uh, how disease spreads, uh, what is herd immunity and why is it important, <laughs> and civil conflict, <laughs> and how much like a forest fire or much like disease, uh, how violence can spread across a population. Now, um, yes, it's emoji, it's not going to be very complicated. They're obviously very simplified. But that's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> so think of a street map. A street map is, is useful not despite being simplified, but because it's simplified. It cuts away what doesn't matter to just leave what does. And that's the issue. A lot of things in our media stuff doesn't matter. Or at least it gives the false impression. Like a concrete example, turn on your cable news and you'll see some gnarly, nasty, gruesome crime story. And you'll probably see them like you know, twice a day or more. Actually, probably a lot, yeah, definitely a lot more. Um, and you might get the impression, and the public opinion in the US right now is that um, the world and the US is getting more dangerous. But if you were to look at beyond the things and look at the trends, it turns out that the US uh, crime rate has been actually dropping since the 1980s across all categories. But the trends only tell you that it's dropping. It doesn't tell you why. And for that, you need to go down beyond the things and the trends to the theory. 
sociology, criminology, psychology, economics, etc., so on and so forth. Uh, and only once you have theory, then can you create a more humane justice system. Because trends only extrapolate to the future. Theories let us create the future. So yeah, that's why we gotta go deeper, as the Inception person says. <laughs> gotta go deeper. Can we go even deeper than theory? Well, I think, yes, there is something fundamental and like underlies all theory. Well, I mean, other than, you know, philosophy and math and logic and language and the scientific method itself, there's also systems. Systems thinking. What is systems thinking? Uh, I actually, to be honest, the systems thinking community doesn't know what systems thinking really is. It's kind of, it's very, again, I don't think it's a bug. It might be a feature, maybe. Uh, it's very interdisciplinary, so that's why it's kind of wide, like kind of broad and a little bit fuzzy at places. But at its core, this is what system thinking is. So in our day-to-day -day lives, we kind of think uh, of cause and effect in a linear fashion. A affects B, affects C, and so on. But the world's not linear. It's loopy, according to the world of systems thinking, where A can affect B and B can affect A. So, you know, stuff like vicious cycles, virtuous cycles, you know, arms races, escalation of violence, or kindness beginning more kindness as a positive example, uh, and also stabilizing loops that, uh, like ecological and economic equilibriums. Uh, so, yeah, the next time you think of a cause and effect, don't think about just how A can affect B, but think of any way uh, that B might be able to directly or indirectly affect A. The world's not linear, it's loopy. So that's the uh, core of systems thinking. So, so whenever you want to tell a story, yes, start with that story, that really, that human story, that human elements that really matters, but go beyond the thing and go for the system. Because it's only once we have a deep understanding of the underlying systems that uh, we can really go where we want to go. Okay, it's still on, just making sure. Water Break 2, the sequel. So, but even if we're informed, we can still kind of have polarized echo chambers. So how do we overcome that? Because people have contradicting viewpoints, or at least seemingly contradicting viewpoints. So I want to show off a simulation uh, that I made about a year and a half ago uh, that I think is a good example of how systems thinking can combine contradictions. And also, this is my one-hit wonder, so people know about this. Uh, Parable of the Polygons is an explorable explanation about discrimination and diversity. Uh, so racism and sexism is a polarizing topic, especially on the internet, to say the least. Um, but yeah, so there's kind of two perspectives that, well, there's more than two, but uh, like one person could say, well, look at uh, the racial ratio in our incarceration system and the gender pay gap. Obviously, on a societal level, there is huge discrimination. But on an individual level, um, a lot of people could say, well, I'm not racist or sexist, and none of my friends are. Uh, and besides, society has a huge taboo against it, so even if people are a little bit biased, how can it be that bad? Parallel of the polygons is a simulation that shows how even a small individual bias can accumulate through a vicious cycle into a really large societal discrimination. So, and I'll just play through it. Uh, and by play through it, I mean a pre-recorded video. So you can drag around shapes, and, and so each shape so only, you can only move the unhappy shapes. And shapes are, un, are unhappy. Okay, okay, fine, it's just moving without me. All right, every shape has this rule, this individual rule. I want to move if less than a third of my neighbors are like me. So on the left-hand side, uh, the triangle is unhappy because less than a third of its neighbors are like it, only one out of six. On the middle section, uh, it's totally happy because exactly one third of its neighbors are like it, two out of six. And for the rightmost one, it's just meh. It's just totally full of its, uh, its, own, its own peeps. So, so keep in mind, uh, look at the middle section. Every shape is okay being in the minority in their own local neighborhood. Uh, so it's a very small bias. Every one of them would be okay being in the minority. And yet, and yet, in a larger society, uh, so right now I'm just moving around the unhappy shapes uh, randomly, not really thinking, just moving them to a random empty spot, not really thinking where they, they're going. Uh, but that small individual bias like accumulate, it cascades. Because once uh, 
someone moves out of their neighborhood, that neighborhood changes, and so more people move out of that neighborhood, and eventually you get something like this, where it started off like totally randomly mixed, and now there's definitely a blue section and yellow sections, and this is square town, this is triangle town. Wow, what is that? What is up with that? So, yeah, a vicious cycle, a loop. And that's how you can combine that contradiction, where someone could reasonably say there is a huge discrimination on societal level, and while someone could reasonably say that for individuals, it might not be, be that much. And again, I just want to emphasize this is, I'm not saying this is how it always works. Like, there are some very top-down discriminatory cases, but I think for uh, at least bottom-up cases, this is how, uh, at least it's a plausible mechanism for how uh, this kind of uh, discrimination can arise from the bottom up. Uh, another thing to emphasize is that it's not just presenting both sides. Uh, <laughs> instead, because you know, if you just do that, then you know, confirmation bias. People will just pick the side that they already believe in. Uh, what you do instead is to combine both sides, not just merely present them. Show that they can be both part of the same thing. Let's talk about conflict. I hope you like this illustration of conflict. <laughs> Good illustration. I worked for days on this one. It's my masterpiece. Um, so a bunch of conflict mediators are uh, actually already using systems thinking to uh, help people resolve conflicts. So here we have like a little toy example of a very basic conflict. Uh, one person would have a linear cause and effect story that they have. They attacked us, so we're just fighting back. And the other side will also have the story. They attacked us, so we're just fighting back. But the world's not linear. It's loopy. Yeah. And in this case, it's a pretty common pattern. You know, the vicious cycle, arms race, the escalation of violence. Uh, so the conflict mediator uh, uses system thinking, shows it to all the parties involved that the system is their common enemy, not each other. And maybe once they realize that the system is their common enemy, maybe they can work together. At least that's the hope. This might be the part where I drop the word empathy. And I want to say, I really, like, I really like empathy. I've made stories and games for empathy. Uh, kind of a buzzword nowadays. Not like synergy bad, but <laughs> kind of kind of getting, kind of where gamification is, that's where empathy kind of is. <laughs> uh, I can see the tweets now. Nikki hates empathy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, I th but really, um, like, yeah, empathizing with individuals is important. But here's the thing about systems. Uh, the individual, I mean, they matter, but not as much as the system itself. So the em empathy is to individual. It's important. You know, you have to start with the individual. But you also got to look at the system. And so if information is making us feel more polarized, more disconnected, then what system thinking tells us is that we're all connected. It's kind of a cliche, but we're all connected whether or not we like it and whether or not those connections are healthy. A lot of the time, they're not healthy. But in that case, the system is our common enemy, not the individuals. Water break three from the creators of water break one and water break two. <laughs> so even if we're informed and connected, we can still feel disempowered. You can say, well, now I am very informed about the system, and I know we're all in this together, and we're trapped. This sucks. What can we do? And uh, I don't know. I really hoped I would be able to figure this out by the time I was scheduled to give this talk. But um, given how people have been like, dealing with political philosophers, have been dealing with this problem for like millennia, uh, I, guess, I guess it's just a thing we'll have to keep thinking about forever. Uh, how can people, uh, like average daily, you know, your average citizen, feel empowered or like actually make a change. Still figuring it out, but I think I have some like partial half-baked ideas um, that I'll show off in this prototype, which is not out. And also, I yes, the UI is a little bit bad, but prototype, just rough ideas. So it's a simulation of the school to prison pipeline, at least using uh, US uh, statistics. Uh, so it's got six boxes, and people move from box to box. So students at the top, employed, unemployed in the middle, and incarcerated at the bottom. Uh, and so they move probabilistically. 
Uh, and the probabilities are based off the actual stats on race, uh, age, education, income, employment, and incarceration, at least for the US. Um, and they move around probabilistically based on those stats. And you can also like uh, ask, you can change those stats in the sidebar to ask what if. What if uh, fewer juveniles were incarcerated? What if uh, employment prospects were better? And each box is also separated. And each, like, the parts of the sidebar also, are also separated by box. So you can say, like, if you're a small business owner, uh, you get the little box uh, where you control the probabilities of who gets employed. Like, what, do you want to hire X cons? Or how do you want to increase job prospects? How often do you have to uh, fire or lay people off? So not only do you get to ask what if, you can also ask what can I or people like me can do? And how would that affect the entire system? And so here it is just running simulations, probabilities using the real stats from the Bureau of Justice, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. using real stats. Uh, and you can also focus on an individual story. Uh, so you can click on someone and you can see the individual story and the system at the same time. And so as it runs, you can also think like, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a teacher. What if I help people, more people go to college? Or I'm a, sm I'm a small business owner. What if I didn't discriminate against ex-cons? Or uh, I'm a policymaker. What if I were to get rid of mandatory minimums or at least reduce them? And in a prototype, you can't really see how it affects the entire system. But the idea, hopefully once this is done, is that you'll be able to see what small change you can do in your field and how that ripples out throughout the entire system. So that's an idea for maybe how system thinking can help us be more empowered, maybe. Um, here's kind of my thought of why people might feel disempowered. And it's pretty, uh, I'll say it's like a pretty legitimate reason. But I think it comes from having a linear story, believing that power comes from one party controlling another coming, uh, controlling another, and uh, crap rolls downhill, and things are terrible. So you know, there are like you know, at the very top, there's the corporations or the government, and they control the media or the middlemen who control uh, a very easy, easily manipulated majority. And if you're not at the root cause, and on a, in a linear cause and effect story, there's only one root cause. Uh, if you're not at the root cause, if you're not at the very top, then you have no power and you can't really do anything. And that's a very disempowering um, story and idea. But the world's not linear. It's... Yay! Thank you. <laughs> and when the world is loopy, there is no root cause. Because, and, that would, and that's great. That means any part of the system where you, at, where you are at uh, your effects through feedback loops, vicious cycles, virtual cycles, uh, stagnating and stabilizing loops, your effects can ripple throughout the entire system. Just like much, just a lot like how in Power of the Polygons uh, showed how even a very small bias or effect in a local neighborhood uh, can ripple out throughout the entire world. Um, maybe, maybe that's how systems thinking can empower us, maybe. Uh, as a more concrete example, for example, um, you're a small business owner and you want to hire ex-cons. And it turns out that it works pretty well and your peers, your network in a, your business community also decides to hire ex-cons for themselves. And, but the ex-cons uh, also have their own, you know, their own network, their own friends. Mostly people in uh, poor, disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, communities of color, um, and so they're, they're, they reach out to their network, and it just keeps spreading, and public opinion shifts on race and criminal justice. And public opinion then turns into public pressure on politicians to fix their stuff. And that is a lot much easier than said than done. <laughs> but again, these are all like half-baked ideas. And I'm still figuring this out, and I hope some of you all will join on figuring out systems thinking and stuff like that. As the old saying, joke goes, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. <laughs> and what systems thinking tells us, we are not trapped in the system, we are the system. Water break four, water break origins, hydrate harder.
Anyway, and that is how we could use systems thinking to give us a deeper understanding, to overcome polarization, and maybe, just maybe, we can change the world. So what? <laughs> so what? Because uh, I just gave you a whole bunch of theory, and not a lot is actually practical. You might be saying, Nikki, I got deadlines after this conference. I got to learn D3. I'm only up to D2. <laughs> what do you got for me? Well, I'm glad you asked, said hypothetical person. Uh, so here are five tools I'm going to give you on how to tell stories about systems and turn systems into stories. And again, all the links uh, and projects I'll be referring to will be posted uh, at the end of this slide talky thing. Uh, so five tools from least cray cray to implement to most cray cray to implement. And the first tool is nothing, or at least nothing new. So you know, you don't have to change your workflow, your tools, because people have been telling stories about systems in all kinds of media. So here are three of my favorite examples. Uh, the Wire is the quintessential example, with its ensemble cast, multiple perspectives, and you know, every season is showing a different part of the system, a different part of the Baltimore criminal justice system. Uh, so yeah, if you make video or you know, film stuff, like check out The Wire. That's how you, that is how you do uh, storytelling about systems. The other two aren't really about systems, but they're still really great ways to do storytelling from multiple perspectives and in a non-linear way. So for those of you who make infographics, I heard you like graphs. Uh, Chris Ware, check out the work of Chris Ware and specifically uh, his graphic novel, Building Stories. It's, it's, like 12, it's an anthology of like 12 different stories that can be read in any, any order. Uh, and each installment, I guess, is so non-linear, has multiple perspectives, timelines intersecting with each other, all which way what. So that's really how you can do a non-linear storytelling in a visual format, using the grammar of comics or something. And then there is, is quote unquote, postmodern literature, like uh, one of my favorite books, um, Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions, where it switches from character to character, timeline to timeline. Uh, and also, not, not pictured here, but another one that I read recently and really like, um, Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad. Uh, and both of these um, postmodern literatures, um, yeah, are a way of doing multiple perspectives and nonlinear storytelling. So the point is, you don't need simulations or anything fancy to tell stories about systems, because people have been doing it in other media. Not very common, actually pretty rare, so, but it has been done. Tool number two is the causal loop diagram. Uh, and I've actually been doing this the entire talk. Uh, so causal loop diagram is, yeah, AFXB and so on. So here's my favorite example uh, that I found randomly through Google image search. Uh, so it's about the war on drugs, specifically on uh, focusing on heroin. And so I really like this one because with just three loops, it tells three really deep stories. So the first causal loop is about how if we seize heroin, yes, it reduces it in the short run, but a reduction in inventory, you know, supply and demand, redu reducing inventory drives up the price, driving up the price drives up profits, and driving up profits drives up the incentive to create more heroin. So that's the first loop. Second loop is if the price goes up, uh, addicts, uh, you know, they, the man can't fall. They're addicted to it. Uh, they have to resort to a petty crime, um, to, you know, to petty crime, which results in arrest. You know, so that's our um, burgeoning incarceration system there. Uh, and with arresting uh, addicts, um, that means less heroin is used, which means the inventory goes up. And that brings us to the third loop, where if there is leftover inventory, uh, the drug dealers will have to market it, so to speak, and build, bring in more new addicts into the system. So three completely different stories. Like, this is the content of like three documentaries, and it's captured in one diagram. I really like, I, I really like the causal loop diagram. Uh, but if you ever do a Google image search on this, um, they all look this bad. Like, Apparently, the, the systems thinking community doesn't realize there's more than one font than Times New Roman, <laughs> and more than one shade of blue than hex code 0000FF. So please, if you're a visual designer and you want to use 
powerful tool of causal loop diagrams. Please, oh my gosh, make this better because it looks horrible. Even if it's powerful. Oh, my eyes are bleeding. <laughs> uh, tool number three. Water break five, water returns. Stock inflow model, oops, stock inflow models. So a stock inflow, uh, Im imagine a stock as a bathtub and you know things flow in, things flow out. That's a stock inflow model. It's kind of similar to the causal loop diagram. Um, so this one is the, here's where simulation actually comes in. Stock and flow models are specifically created for simulation. Uh, and when I was like researching on stock and flow models, it turns out the earliest simulation was not done on an electronic computer. It was done on a water computer. This is a computer made of water. What? So instead of electricity flowing through wires, we have water flowing through pipes. And this was created in 1949 by some New Zealand person to uh, simulate the economy. And so, you know, it's like one box, uh, one tank is the treasury, money flows in, money flows out, and it worked pretty well. I mean, it, it worked well enough to get a place in a museum, so good for you, 1949 New Zealand person. Uh, but yeah, people still use stock and flow simulations today. Um, you know, uh, climate scientists use it to uh, model uh, greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere and greenhouse gases being taken out. Uh, more greenhouse gases are going in and coming out, obviously. Um, but, and also, like, uh, also simulating economies. Um, people still use stock and flow for that. And also like uh, modeling disease. Basically, you can use stock and flow simulations to simulate anything where you have a thing and things go into the thing and things come out of the thing. It's a pretty flexible uh, tool to use. And tool number four is probability simulations. Uh, and this one's actually used by a lot of data visualizers already. And these are examples that a lot of you might already know. So first one is Nathan Yaz's uh, Years You Have Left to Live, comma, probably, uh, where using the real CDC data, he simulates people being born and dying over and over again, and you get a nice little histogram of death over there. And that can tell you um, how many years you have left to live, probably. Uh, the second one is... Um, the one that actually really inspired um, my prototype, uh, the Marshall Project made, the Marshall Project with in collaboration with 538 made the parole simulator uh, where you, you can choose the trade-off. You can choose at what cutoff uh, risk people get parole or don't get parole and you can make that trade-off for yourself and see how it works probabilistically. Uh, the third one with the goat and the car, uh, that is actually a pretty infamous mathematical paradox. So this one is created by, this simulation was created by Victor Powell uh, as an explainer of the Monty Hall uh, paradox. And finally, um, it's election season, um, Martin uh, Lambrecht uh, made Rock and Pole, which, it's a great title, uh, which shows off why a 2% chance, a 2 percentile difference in the polling results isn't that much to analyze about because that is the margin of error. So he made a simulation uh, explaining margin of error. And again, I will have a link to all the links to all of this. And at the very far theoretical uh, end, we have agent-based modeling. Uh, also similar uh, is cellular automata, but let's just, okay. Agent-based modeling. Um, so an agent is a thing that makes decisions. And an agent-based model is a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of agents that make decisions based off of others' decisions. So that's like infinite feedback loops there. It's also loopy. So for example, uh, it's a concrete example, parallel polygons is an agent-based model. Uh, parallel polygons was actually, I stole <laughs> a, uh, an agent-based model uh, created by Thomas Schelling, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist. He's the one who created the original model. Uh, Weihart and I just, uh, added cute shapes and smiles to it to explain in such a cute way segregation. What a cute topic. Um, but it's, you don't have to do just grids. Uh, you can also do uh, a network. And yeah, grid, yeah, grids and networks, all that. And uh, the CDC also uses agent-based models to simulate uh, disease spread and how to combat disease in real time. So simulations save lives. Uh, so now that you know the theory and the tools, and I realize I have a minute left, how to simulate the universe in 134 easy steps. Step one. Pick a thing. Pick a story. Because you need, you need that human element. You need that human hook. But go beyond that. And step two, find the trends. 
And step three, go beyond that and find a theory. Don't, you don't need to be an expert on everything, but just like learn enough to get to step four, find the nonlinear loopy causes and effects, the vicious and virtuous cycles. And once you have that, step five, pick a tool. You don't need to get super complicated. Just pick the tool that works for you. And once you have a prototype, step six, iterate. In step seven, iterate. In step eight, iterate, and you just kind of keep doing this well and over and over again until you have something that really informs people, something that really connects people, something that really empowers people. And once you make something that does all that, step 134, ship it. <laughs> and step 135, fix bugs. All right, thank you so much. Links over there.